Okay. Excellent. All right. Um, uh, so with that, we can move on. Um, uh, as this is an IETF meeting, uh, we're subject to the note well. So if you've not read it, uh, please take a moment to familiarize yourself with it. Um, and just a friendly reminder, please be respectful and courteous to others uh, in the meeting. And hopefully um, uh, this should be super productive and useful to all those who are participating. Um, we have uh, quite a stacked um, agenda, uh, several presentations from different people um, with uh, different perspectives on the, the topic of IP address privacy, how they're used, what the implications are for clients and servers, um, and what can be done to sort of improve the situation. Um, uh, the list of talks is here, as well as the slides uh, in the email that Sarah sent out uh, with a link to the agenda. You can find uh, the PDF documents or PDF representations of the slides uh, if you're interested in follow, following along that way. Um, before we go further, uh, just a quick note, um, the notes for the meeting are in the chat. Uh, so the beeping noise is not just you. I have uh, snoring animals next to me, so I apologize in advance. <laughs> um, uh, it's, yeah, it's a dog. Um, uh, the, the, the notes have blue sheets at the bottom of the page, so if you scroll down um, uh, and fill out your name, that would be great. Um, uh, uh, we also need, as I was saying earlier, we need a, a minute taker and uh, hopefully a driver scribe as well. Um, and we can't really make forward progress until we have them. So I'm going to pause here for a moment um, and hopefully wait for someone uh, to volunteer. It's a super easy job, by the way, especially since this is recording. Whoever was just talking, there was extreme interference. Looks like you got a volunteer in the chat. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, uh, and Jabber Sprite, perhaps? Um, I don't know. Uh, Sarah, Siobhan, if you have Jabber open, could you? I will keep an eye on it. OK, awesome. And we have Jonathan as well. Lovely. All right, I think that's sufficient. Um, uh, with that, um, I just also want to take a, a quick moment to pause. Uh, does anyone have any sort of adjustments they'd like to make to the, the agenda as, as is presented here? Um, Hopefully not, because the, 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 they're structured in such a way that the, the order um, uh, sort of makes sense. But uh, of course, we're hoping to feedback. OK, um, hearing none, I guess we can uh, kick things off. So um, uh, first up is um, uh, Demetrius, Philip, and David to talk about uh, fraud and abuse. I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, and we'll pass the ball over to, um, I guess, David? Yeah. Um, OK. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Oh, great. Does it appear for you? David, do you have the share option? Yes. yes Lovely. Right. OK. I'm going to mute now. And um, we have about uh, 20 minutes, so um, let's get this going. Cool. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. We're going to discuss uh, anti. We're going to begin things with uh, anti abuse applications of IPs. Uh, so uh, I'm David from Google's ad traffic quality team, uh, and today I'm joined by Demetrius from White Ops uh, and Philip from YouTube's trust and safety team. Uh, as we know, browsers are undergoing a fundamental shift in providing real privacy for users. Uh, we've seen this with uh, efforts such as third party cookie blocking. Uh, efforts such as Chrome's privacy sandbox are trying to provide privacy preserving APIs to address key use cases of third party cookies. Uh, and they also include fraud and abuse detection, uh, such as the trust token API. Uh, with third party cookies being blocked, browsers also need to address covered tracking in order to provide pr privacy for users. Uh, IPs are a fairly stable uh, identifier and form of covered tracking. Uh, that the ecosystem and this form uh, uh, are looking to address. Uh, but at the same time, IPs have been very important for anti-abuse uh, detection across a broad range of applications, uh, which we're, we're going to discuss in this presentation. So, uh, as solutions are being developed to provide IP privacy, uh, it's important to maintain security and anti-abuse capabilities. Otherwise, we risk uh, eroding the trust and safety of the internet. Uh, what we'll do next is go over several applications uh, if there are questions, uh, let's hold them towards the end of this presentation. Uh, Demetrius? 
Thank you, David. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dimitris Theodorakis. I'm the director of detection at MyTopes for the past three years. We are a cybersecurity company fighting fraud and abuse across a number of use cases for almost a decade. Uh, in the past five years alone, more than half a billion passwords have been exposed as a result of online data breaches. Uh, stolen credentials are subsequently used in credential staffing attacks deployed by massive botnets uh, that are tasked to take over valuable user accounts. Uh, these types of attacks are costing businesses millions of dollars a year uh, and are detrimental to users' security and privacy. And this is just an example. Uh, at Mitovs, we've picked up on botnets that are designed to listen to music on large streaming platform. You know, it, it turns out that bad actors are incentivized to boost the popularity of a song in order to get a bigger cut from copyrights. Ad fraud is another good example. We estimate that billions of dollars are lost every year due to fraudulent activity. Cyber criminals are often using this income to further improve their operations. And IPs are one of the most reliable signals we use to detect and prevent these types of abuse. Next slide, David. Oh, hi, um, I'm Philip from YouTube's Trust and Safety Group, um, also working in anti-abuse for the past uh, seven, eight-ish years. Most of the things that we talk about in terms of the use cases for IP are about stopping bad folks from doing bad stuff. Um, but they're also a really important tool to help the rightful owner stay in their account, for example. Um, if we see some authentication activity coming from a network that's well established for the user, we have a higher degree of trust. Of course, on the other hand, if we see an attempted sign in and it's a network that we haven't seen the user before, and maybe it's also a device that we haven't seen the user on before, we may issue more challenges, like challenge a second factor or another email address that we have on file. And the reason that we like doing that selectively is that we don't want to lock people out of their accounts. So we want to have that variable conflict, that assessment of confidence for variable friction when challenging users, even in the good case to help to help good users. Um, let's go to the next slide. When we talk about stopping bad folks, being able to look at the client, the originating client of the request and being able to aggregate on IPs as an entity is super powerful for a number of use cases. Um, when we look at account creation, we want to protect the account ecosystem. The reason we want to protect it is bad actors like having a large number of accounts. Um, they can pretend that certain things are popular, whether that's ideologies or products, et cetera, that actually aren't. These can be used for fraud. And in those cases, there is no account at the point of account creation by definition. And so IPs are one of the few signs that we can use to look for hotspots, a sign of activity. Account ownership or account takeover is a really important privacy use case. My, my accounts with my bank, uh, with my medical provider, all of that PII in there is only as safe as that account is. If somebody takes control of that account, they may have my email addresses, health records, et cetera, really bad privacy breaches. And there again, because this is a usually a sign-in type of abuse, we again rely on IPs to indicate hotspots of attempted authentication activity and also to get a sense of what are the networks that are being used by different hijacking groups. Um, a third uh, privacy assumption that we want to uh, maintain with our user base is around what I want to call the contextual integrity of information. Um, this was recently surfaced in the news through a company called Clearview AI that scraped and aggregated a whole lot of information across the web um, in order to facilitate uh, face identification. And so you could take an arbitrary photo, and then they would link it to real-world identities that they had scraped from LinkedIn and other service providers. Clearview AI isn't the only offender in that field. Um, there are a number of other companies that have tried to do similar ones, including ones that look for footage that people had taken of political protests and then used images from that protest footage, which was by itself scraped and recontextualized 
with records of people from you know other services where the world was established. People assume that this stuff is you know contextualized in one service, and the service providers really have to look at who's accessing it to prevent that sort of aggregation. And so there, we want to look at IPs as hotspots for crawling and other sorts of read-only activity to, um, to harden the extraction and recontextualization of that data. Um, finally, for low latency interfaces, so these could be you know, ticket sales or you know, ad auctions, anything where you have a split second to make a decision whether you trust something or not, um, IPs, um, subnets, ASNs, et cetera, are really powerful hubs for reputation of you know, how much do we want to examine this traffic, how much we want to stall this transaction. Uh, that's that for that slide. All right, uh, moving on to discuss uh, data centers. They're, we found them to be often used as an easy way to scale uh, abuse and enable cybercrime through bulletproof hosting, for instance. Uh, IPs are a key entity uh, for identifying such traffic, uh, and without them, it would be difficult to catch such naive attacks. Uh, because of that, uh, there are public data center IP lists which make it easy for uh, any site to deploy uh, and block such traffic. And Dimitris? The Eve botnet is, a, is another good example of how IPs are used for abuse detection. Eve is one of the largest botnets we've observed doing ad fraud in the past few years. It relied, as you can see here, on a number of different modules, including a residential proxy network, hijacked IPs, and the well-known Kofter malware to deliver its fraudulent payloads. At its peak, Eve was generating more than a million ad requests every minute, causing tens of millions of dollars in losses. Botnets are both extremely profitable from a financial perspective, but also found profound privacy violations. Kofter, for example, that was used by Eve here, has historically been known for distributing ransomware and payloads designed to steal personal information. In October of 2018, the FBI executed an international takedown. Eight people were indicted and a number of suspects were extradited from around the globe. As we speak, there, there are people behind bars in Brooklyn, New York, as a result of this takedown. IPs were the main indicators we used to detect Eve and collaborate with the law enforcement and the rest of the cross industry group that took down Eve. I would go, you know, as far as saying that bringing such consequences would have been impossible if we didn't have access to IPs. Next slide, please. Most of the abuse that we've talked about here has been cybercrime, where abuse is taking place in the virtual world. Um, but IPs are also quite important for real-world law enforcement and real-world crimes. Um, one thing that's particularly um, important in this context is child sexual abuse material, where the crime takes place in the physical world, um, but then is amplified, and the evidence of it is spread online. Um, there, there are strong industry connections with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, or a NITMIC, where a number of providers, including YouTube, um, share abusive material with them, including any evidence we have about how it got onto the platform. Um, and with the full brunt of law enforcement, things like IP and different things we know about the devices have led to convictions of people who perpetrate these crimes and also have assisted the victims in being freed from uh, pretty terrible situations. Cool, and then I think the final wrap-up slide. Um, so I guess takeaways, one is when we look at protecting TCP IP networks, knowing the address of the originating client is really fundamental to everything that's been built up over the past, I don't know, 20, 30 years. Um, if we simply take that away, uh, it really empowers the cyber criminals of all stripes that operate here. I'm not just you know, trying to hump this up, but it's, it's really pivotal to all of these anti-abuse systems that have been built up. That abuse in and of itself is detrimental to privacy. In the case of account takeover, for example, user trust 
and also the commerce that allows these services to sustain. Um, the privacy goals are critical. We have to fix the privacy situation, but this can't be an either or situation. We can't take fence posts off of the security fence to build a privacy fence, and we can't take fence posts off the privacy fence to build a security fence. We have to really think about how do we how do we solve for all these use cases while also improving user privacy. And I think that was it for our presentation. Um, excellent. So we have time for questions. Um, I feel like eight minutes or so. Um, if anyone wants to ask a question, um, just pop yourself in the queue, um, plus Q minus Q, typical ITF stuff, uh, and ask away. Otherwise, um, there's a question from, I believe, Muria. Um, uh, I don't know if you can see the chat, uh, Philip, Demetrius, David. Um, perhaps, perhaps you'd like to respond. Yeah, uh, the question is, uh, isn't this just the tip of the iceberg by only catching those criminals that are too stupid to use Tor? Um, so with uh, a much, I can't speak directly to Tor. Um, I can speak to just in aggregate, the, um, the success that law enforcement has had in convicting folks. Um, I'm not sure to what extent different proxy services um, were able to provide information to assist in those cases. Um, but whether it's a mixture of technology choice um, or the traceability of some of those things, um, it, it does appear to be useful um, in those trials. Okay, I believe uh, Christian is next. Yeah, I mean, the, the, that's a classic tension. There's a classic tension between privacy and uh, I would say accountability in general. Is that uh, if everything you do is exposed, uh, then the accountability is much greater because you can be uh, followed for whatever you did. So th that dilemma is not new. Um, and and I have said that in all those discussions, it's very seldom that we don't hear the tension between privacy and child abuse. So I'd like to uh, give a, a request to this anti-abuse presentation to uh, tease down the tension there and specifically tease down what is the part of anti-abuse that is about protecting the user and what is the part of anti-abuse that is about protecting the service against the user. For example, among the examples you gave, you have some like account fraud, I mean, taking over an account. In that case, we can expect the user to be fully cooperating with the defense. Like, if I, I will be working with my bank to make sure that nobody takes over my bank account. It's very clear. And there are a range of solutions that can be done there if you expect the user to be cooperating. There are other applications like, say, ad protection, in which uh, you want to make sure that the ad continue to gather revenues. And in that case, the user is not cooperating because, I mean, the user is a, a fraudulent bot and the user is not even supposed to be identified. So I'd like to, to tease down the use case of anti abuse to separate those in which the user cooperates and those in which it doesn't. Um, I could uh, take a first stab at this question. Very good question. Thank you, Christian. Um, in the, we presented an, an example of a botnet, uh, the EVE operation. And in that particular case, um, the user is actually a victim. The user's device is infected with malware that is dropping a variety of different payloads, including an actual payload. Um, other payloads could be, you know, a ransomware or uh, even directly stealing personal information. So I think it's to, they also want to cooperate. It's just that they don't have a good way of cooperating. If that, uh, if, if that makes sense. Well, and uh, I'll give you an example from the Windows world. I mean, Windows security uh, is meant, is 
designed so that it protects the user and that the user cooperates. The user will do things like software updates and things like that. On the other hand, if you compare that to the Xbox, Xbox security is based on the idea that uh, user is playing a game and some users are going to enhance their devices so they play the game better and cheat. And so if you want to protect and cheat, then you are basically working against the user, not for the user. And so that this is the kind of tension that I would like to, I mean, show and, and basically be part of the analysis of the various and diverse solutions. This doesn't answer the question, but just to add a, a dimension to it, often you also have multiple parts, like in the case of the scraping and recontextualization. Like I would not want my LinkedIn profile scraped and recontextualized and used to re-identify me in some you know, political activity, um, but I'm not the person who is accessing it. And so in that case, the, the user that's disaffected there might be a fairly passive participant and the actual transaction involves an abusive actor. Um, and so there might be cases where there are some, you know, some consumers that are on the offensive side and some consumers that are very aligned with the defensive side, but that are out of the loop in terms of what is happening. Okay, uh, in the interest of time, I think we should move on to the next person in the queue, uh, who I believe is Tommy. Hi, yeah, I'm Tommy, not the EDM program only. Um, so yeah, thank you for sharing this. It's definitely good to hear this perspective. Um, I guess what I want to ask is if if we take a, a stance in which we say, okay, at some point, you know, there's going to be a future in which we're not going to be able to get the IP address so easily. There's going to be privacy things that we're doing for proxying. In a world like that, if we don't think about just what do we get from IP today, what are the pieces that you'd want to get from an architecture that would allow you to trust the user? Like, can you, what type of things can you imagine getting guarantees about that aren't directly, here's the client's original IP address? Um, what are the building blocks there? I could uh, take a first stab at it again. Um, so there are a few pieces here, right? Like the, um, from my perspective, the most important one is to get signal from a device that we can trust. Uh, and what I mean by that is signal that we can almost guarantee that it hasn't been spoofed until it reached our sensors. Um, and you know, that's from a threat modeling perspective, the biggest challenge uh, we've uh, historically seen. For example, a modified browser that is designed to um, automatically uh, commit a credential staffing attack uh, is often looking for such signals and they are deliberately spoofing them uh, so that we can't uh, do detection. So that, that for me would be a fundamental thing that I would like the new architecture to have. Thank you. Um, the next in the queue is uh, Fernando. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Cool. Uh, so my question is, um, you know, how um, all these changes, if it does, uh, when you switch to IPv6, is there anything that you com you can comment on the topic? I mean, maybe speaking from a place of ignorance, I. I IPv6 doesn't appear to be less identifiable in the like network assignments. Like you tend to still have the upper 64 bits of the address that's fairly stable within like one residential allotment. Um, is there something particular about IPv6 that would complicate this? Uh, yeah, like for example, uh, in principle, you might assume uh, you know you might identify the client uh, you know from the slash 64 subnet, but um, 
you know, in most cases, the recommendation is that a user gets more than a slash 64, and you actually don't know how much he gets. He could get a slash 56, he can get a slash 48. For example, in my case, I have like uh, about six slash 48 availables for myself. Uh, so it's tricky uh, because in IP before, you can, for the most part, assume that the user is behind a slash, you know, slash. Um, um, that, that has a single IP address. Whereas in the IPv6 case, for the most part, you can always assume that he has a, a, a slash 64, but you know that might be ineffective because uh, the user might have like more than that and you cannot actually tell how much the user has. Could be slash 48, could be a slash uh, 56, but that actually depends on the you know, on the provider, on the ISP. So the specific granularity is like hard to tell. Like for example, if I like thinking out loud, I had to do that. I probably you know start you know with a slash uh, 64, but then would still have to aggregate that like further because they might the user might have control for you know a larger address space. I think that, uh, unfortunately, most fraud detection companies will force an IPv4 connection instead so that they get that uh, V4 IP. So, so um, sorry, you mean that they don't consider uh, the, uh, the IPv6 addresses? They will, but they will also try to get the um, respective IPv4 address. And what if they can't? It's a good scenario. And yeah, I'm sure. Like, yeah, we would fall back to the V6, but we would we would lose entropy in the in, in the signal we get for sure. Mm -hmm. So the 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 uh, our ability to use this as a high information signal will be degraded. Okay. Okay. The same thing applies to IPs that are used by, you know, uh, mobile cellular networks behind, like that have like these huge nuts. Uh, the the ability to use this as a as a uh, stable identifier degrades in several scenarios, uh, but it's still extremely important for uh, detecting botnets because on a large scale you still get a lot of valuable information from uh, from IPs. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering that, uh, I'm thinking out loud that in the, in the case of... Uh, I'm in sorry, the case I, I, of, we do have to move on to the next question. Um, could Would you mind following up offline or perhaps in the chat or something? Of course. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank it was a great question. Um, and so lastly, we have Matthew. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, very cool. Um, yeah, so I'm a Tor developer and Obviously, this is a very contentious uh, topic, um, but I think kind of following up on, on Tommy's question, you know, this this idea that IP addresses are so fundamental to abuse tracking and, and, and anti-abuse and uh, detection, and it seems like you have fundamentally built tracking and surveillance of users as a mechanism for um, for identifying abuse. And I wonder how, like, how do you build a signal into a, a product and, and in, into a, a protocol that we're trying to provide privacy while still revealing some information that, that lets you identify when a user is, I guess, considered legitimate versus abusive or, or a botnet. And like, what does that signal look like other than, it, it sounds like you want um, like remote attestation that uh, the device or, or program is, is from, is being used by an actual person. Is that correct? That would be one piece of the architecture, which I think is pretty fundamental. 
um, but that wouldn't be enough, especially for uh, all the different use cases. And one, I think I one thing I would mention uh, is that I agree that it's a it's a high entropy signal, but the intention, not just the intention, at the end of the day, what we are tracking is a botnet. We are not tracking. Our goal is never to track humans. In fact, we uh, almost don't we don't care about tracking humans the goal is to track the sources of where the abusive activity uh, is originating yeah i think one challenge that you know where this really is at odds is the need to have a persistent bad reputation if a small subset of otherwise really great individuals or users or whatever do a bad thing and absent the ability to carry that reputation forward and prevent further abuse, it ends up having a net negative effect on the broader network. Like the reason that Tor traffic, not speaking for my employer right now, but the, maybe one of the reasons that Tor traffic faces challenges across the internet in terms of blockages is that inability right now to say, hey, this subset of users, big troublemakers, vast majority of other people, totally not troublemakers. Um, and how do we, you know, that without going for re-identifiability of individual users, how do you still persist that kind of bad reputation where it is important for the rest of the population to stay safe? Um, all right, so uh, in the interest of time, we, we do have to move forward. Uh, so I wanna thank the speakers for the great talk and the great discussion that followed. Um, uh, please feel free to continue chatting in the chat here or on Java or whatever, or take it to the list. Um, I think there's a lot of useful uh, potential questions to follow up on. Um, so next up is uh, Damien. Damien, I have uh, passed you the presenter's token, so you should be able to share your screen now. Um, but okay. if not. Let me see if I can get going here. You can see your slides. Okay. And you can hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, so the, the previous presentation gave an overview of abuse concerns. I'm going to be doing a deep dive into one form of abuse that we've seen, uh, which is DDoS and uh, botnets. Um, so, you know, we often think, like, what's wrong with a little abuse? Like, you know, if you're dealing with an ad system, sure, there will be some click fraud. It costs, you know, a big company a few million dollars a year or more. I, I don't know exact numbers, but, like, what's wrong with that? Well you know, what if there is abuse just goes completely off the charts, right? Um, you know, turn it up to 11. Now, now you have this problem that you're not just dealing with abuse that costs the company money, but maybe you're putting somebody completely out of business. Um, and this isn't just companies, right? Um, this is individuals, bloggers, you know, anybody trying to, uh, you know, push, put information online is at risk of, a DOS attack uh, taking them down. Um, so, you know, here's a post from a security journalist pointing out that, you know, some teenager didn't like his his uh, posts about botnets and they took him off the internet and they actually got his DOS mitigation provider to kick him off. Um, so, you know, when, when we think about this, like one of the challenges we have to face is like, who should be allowed to enact global censorship? Do we want teenagers to be in that? class of people, um, or, or do we need to, you know, consider what to do about that? Um, and it's not just small sites, um, you know, there are banks that see this, um, and it's important to consider like, you know, banks are critical infrastructure. This affects national security, right? And so, you know, these are sort of very large issues and, uh, and it can be quite important. Um, so, you know, we also need to think about how quickly do we have to respond to attacks? So, you know, if there's an attack, it's that outage is immediate. This isn't something where the attack ramps up slowly over a day and you have time to think about it and respond and add capacity. Like the instant that attack starts, uh, you probably have an outage. And so one of the things that we focus on here is, you know, sure, you might be able to look at the traffic and have some human analyze it and figure out you know, some pattern to the attack traffic and, you know, triage that and put some change that deals with that. But humans tend to be pretty slow. That's about 20 minutes um, in, in the best case scenario where you, 
you know, have an easy signal that you can, can look at. Um, and so everything needs to be automated, right? That's the only way that you can really mitigate these in a, in a reasonable time period. Um, and that means you're looking at behavior over seconds or minutes. Um, and one of the challenges with that automation is, you know, yes, everybody's looking at machine learning to try to automate what a human would do, but realistically, even with machine learning, there isn't always a, uh, a simple answer or an answer at all. Sometimes it's just completely impossible um, to, to identify a signature for the attack and you just have to look at who is attacking you and block that. And so we need these extremely high fidelity signals um, of which, you know, an IP is, is one. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about, you know, what are the uh, signals that we look at uh, to filter this traffic? Um, so, you know, we can look at the request they're making. Frequently, the request is just get slash, like they're fetching the homepage. Not a whole lot of information there. Uh, we can look at the user agent. I have seen a botnet whose user agent was I am botnet. That was a very clear signal. But frequently, they're just going to use a, a common user agent or a set of hundreds of uh, real user agents. So that's not a, a guaranteed defense. Um, you could look at the refer. Maybe if you're on a, a site, you expect the refer to be from your site. Um, botnets now will spoof a refer coming, claim to be coming from Google or you know Baidu, various other uh, popular sites, uh, search engines usually. Um, you know, we can also look at the request rate. But how do you know the request rate if you don't know user P or you know something else about the user? You need some ability to um, look at two completely new users to your service and know that those two users are distinct from each other, that they're not the same user. Um, otherwise, you wouldn't know whether those two requests should be counted against the same bucket um, if, if you had like a token bucket scheme for issuing, for limiting the number of requests. Um, you know, once you've identified the attack, then you have to figure out how, do you, how are you going to block it? That the, in a way that they can't modify, you know. So I've I've already mentioned like you know you if you just block on the user on the user agent of IM botnet, they can change that to another valid user agent. So we need some signature that they can't easily uh, change. Um, some DOS attacks this is can be easy. So you know if UDP amplification attacks like DNS amplification, we can look for UDP traffic with source port fifty three and block that. That's very straightforward. Um, similarly, TCP also has a form of amplification uh, where you send a SYN packet and the SYN ACK packets to the victim. Um, but if the victim isn't expecting to receive SYN ACK packets, you can just drop all of those. So some things we already have a way of filtering without um, something that the attacker can work around. But if there's always a way that the attacker can impersonate a totally new user to your system, then IP is the only thing that's left that, that is sort of a, a guaranteed thing that we can always filter on. Um, we also need to think a little bit about collateral damage. Um, you know, what if multiple users share an IP? We see this today with NAT or uh, carrier grade NAT, um, you know, businesses, whatever. Um, that can be great for privacy, right? We can't distinguish all of those users. Um, you know, if, if the website does need to distinguish, they can use cookies or something, which is sort of a, a user acceptable uh, way of, of distinguishing them. Um, but if we do IP-based blocking, you know, then we're stuck with having to deal with, you know, what is the what do we do when there is collateral damage? And one of the tricks we use there is captchas because that allows us to distinguish if it was a, a real user or not. Um, I think you know Tor will give you lots of examples of how they don't appreciate seeing captchas, um, even though they're not targeted. You know, that's just one of these things that happens. Um, okay. Um, and I and I just want to sort of reemphasize like how big these attacks are. Um, there was a case where, in October 2016, a botnet took down a DNS provider with a, a small SYN flood, that led to a massive outage of a lot of services. And just to give a sense of how important this was, like there was a congressional hearing on this, right? So this isn't like a small thing or you know minor disruption to the internet. Like people take this quite seriously. This isn't just the U.S. Um, Liberia, the same botnet. Uh, took down like basically an entire country, um, you know, and then we're also seeing like, 
you know, pandemic's a great thing going on right now. Like people are attacking that as well. It's it's anything to get attention or or to cause problems. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to sort of reveal how significant these things are. Now, in that case of the Mirai botnet that took down Dyn in, in 2016, we were able to identify which botnet that was and bring those people to justice. And the way we were able to do that is the same botnet had previously attacked Krebs on security, that journalist I'd mentioned earlier. And when he was kicked off of his other DOS mitigation provider, he came over to Google and he was attacked at Google as well. And we were able to record all of the IPs participating in that attack. And with Krebs permission, because it's his site, his data, we were able to share those IPs with the FBI. And they were able to use that to identify the people who, you know, the command and control for the botnet, trace that back to who had created the botnet and bring those, those kids to justice. So, you know, that's an example of how IPs are used, a, a very explicit example. Um, I also want to mention some other things that we do with IPs, because I, I think it's important to, to realize how this is beneficial to the end user as well. Um, we had a case where we identified uh, malware that was compromising people's machines and sending them through a proxy. And by looking at all the traffic that came through that proxy, we could put a notification at the top of the search results page informing users that they were compromised with this sp specific malware so that they could be aware. If we didn't have IPs accessible to us, we wouldn't have been able to inform users that their machines were compromised. Um, similarly, when we get uh, DOS attacks to some of our customers or to our services, we can inform the owners of those IPs that their machine is participating in a DOS attack. Um, and I think that's an important thing as well. Like, you know, we're not necessarily just using the IP the IP information to protect ourselves, but we can be using this to help those who have compromised machines. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll conclude with like, there's a social good aspect to this. Um, you know, yes, everyone believes privacy is important, but we need to think about what the trade-offs are. Um, you know, so we have to think about censorship, threats to critical infrastructure, um, or the internet itself, um, being able to take down botnets that could be a threat to pretty much any site on the internet and, and also being able to notify people that their machines are compromised. I, I think frequently in the emphasis on privacy, we forget that if you don't have a machine that is secure, then you don't have privacy. You know, so if we can't inform somebody that their machine has been compromised because that would violate their privacy, like their machine has been compromised. They don't have privacy to start with and, and we need to start at, at the fundamentals there. So I'll end there. I, I don't know if we have time for questions. Um, probably have time for one very brief question, um, and thank you for going through that quickly, Damien. Um, all right. Um, if there are none, uh, I think we can move on. Uh, thanks again for the presentation. Um, uh, certainly good to hear about uh, this problem from all different perspectives. Um, so next up in the queue is uh, Fernando, who's going to talk about uh, privacy implications of IP addresses on the client side. Um, so find you, and then I will toss you the token. Okay, um, you should be able to share your screen now. Can you confirm? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you okay. and see your slides. Perfect. Um, so my name is Fernando Gond, and I will be uh, presenting an overview of the privacy implications of um, IPv6 addresses. IP addresses. I will mostly focus on IPv6, but then at the end of the presentation, I will provide a brief um, overview for um, how this applies to IPv4. So. Um, 
before getting into the um, uh, specifics, uh, I'd like to provide like a very uh, brief um, overview of how IPv6 addresses are configured because, you know, all of the analysis that follows, um, you know, essentially relies on, on that background. Um, essentially, in the case of IPv6, we have uh, 128 bit long addresses. Uh, normally, we um, use those uh, 120 bit uh, long addresses as uh, slash 64 subnets uh, with 64 bit interface IDs. Um, and when it comes to how addresses can be configured, there are a variety of mechanisms for that. Uh, we have manual configuration, which is obvious. And then we have two different mechanisms for automatic configuration. Uh, Slack, which is mandatory and uh, essentially relies on the uh, host uh, auto configuring its own address. Whereas uh, we also have the HCP version six, which is optional. And uh, similarly to the IPv4 case, uh, relies on a server to actually lease addresses to, uh, to hosts. Uh, now, uh, the specific mechanism, uh, automatic mechanism for uh, configuring addresses is uh, specified or determined by some bits in route advertisements, which are sent by local routers. Um, essentially, if the RA includes a prefix information option with a A bit set, uh, that means that you will employ Slack for configuring addresses for that prefix. Uh, then if the M bit of the RA is set, then that means that you should employ the HCP version six. And in those cases where you have prefix information options with the A bit set, but also these RAs have the M bit uh, set, it's um, actually uh, rather unspecified what to do, but in most cases, what you do is employing both Slack and the HCP version six. And this means that you might, uh, you might end up configuring addresses for the same prefix with two different mechanisms. So you might end up having multiple addresses for the same prefixes, uh, configure some by, uh, via Slack and others via uh, the HCP version six. Now, um, the next question is, uh, how do we uh, generate the interface IDs? Obviously, is the, the interface ID is the, like the host ID in IPv4, if you wish, like the remaining part other than the prefix. Um, in the case of Slack, we essentially have like three uh, different mechanisms. We have the legacy mechanism that is specified in RFC 4291, which essentially calls for embedding the MAC address in the interface ID. This is legacy, uh, it has been recommended against, but some still use it. So that's why I'm still referring to it. Then there is the mechanism uh, specified in uh, RFC 7217, which um, in, let's say in a simplified way, it calls for computing the interface ID by hashing the network prefix, the subnet prefix uh, with a secret, with a secret key. And then there's also the temporary addresses specified in, in, in 4941 and being revised right now. The, the, the a common revision, it should be out like, you know, anytime soon, which essentially calls for randomizing the interface identifiers and regenerating them over time. Uh, that's for Slack, okay? Now, when it comes to the HCP version six, how to generate the interface identifiers is mostly unspecified. And as a result is uh, for the most part implementation specific. Uh, implementation specific. What happens for uh, most, uh, uh, or for, typically for most implementations is that uh, the servers uh, employ uh, like a small address pool from the whole slash 64 and uh, generate the addresses uh, as a linear sequence. Like most trivial case would be to, for example, start with column, column one, and then the next uh, host that uh, uh, asks for an address gets the column, column two, et cetera, et cetera. So that's as much for the background. So now let's uh, jump into the privacy implications of IPv6 addresses. The implications for the most part have to do with, um, you know, how you uh, generate the interface identifiers. And there are a number of properties that are related to the interface identifiers that, you know, have consequences when it comes to privacy. Um, first one is the stability of the interface identifiers. And the, you know, the basic idea is that the more stable the uh, interface identifier is, 
you know, the longer and the larger the scope in which you can correlate uh, network activity. Uh, on, for example, on one extreme, if you have um, interface identifiers that are constant, that is, you use the same identifier, no matter, you know, uh, which network you attach to, then those will allow for, um, you know, even host tracking, like, you know, correlating network activity, even as you move from one network to another. Then on the other extreme, if uh, you are using randomized interface identifiers, or just let's assume that you use one different address, uh, you know, for each, uh, let's say, TCP connection that you establish, then, you know, network activity correlation, uh, uh, becomes more mitigated or becomes more difficult to some extent. Um, another, you know, characteristic of, of, of addresses, and in this particular case, we are kind of like talking about the aggregate, is that if uh, you are on a network and the interface identifiers on that network follows patterns of different sorts, uh, then that will normally uh, make uh, address scans uh, possible. Uh, we will go uh, through these uh, into more detail later. And the final one is that, um, you know, the, 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 the basic requirement for addresses are, of course, that they are unique, okay? Now, uh, for example, in the case that I mentioned before, where you uh, generate the address or the interface ID in particular by embedding a MAC address, you are actually overloading the semantics of the address. And that means that uh, the interface ID is not just a simple opaque number, but actually uh, you know, has overloaded semantics and it will uh, normally leak or disclose more information. Now, um, a very brief overview of each of these uh, things that I mentioned before. Uh, I mentioned network activity correlation. Essentially, uh, you have two basic uh, forms of attack. One is a passive variant of the attack, and the other one is an active variant. Now, in the passive uh, variant, essentially, you have a host that you know connects to one network, network one in this case, and it configures the address by embedding the, the MAC address. Okay. Um, then, if that node, if that host moves to a different network. If the host is employing a constant in, uh, interface identifier, it will employ the same interface ID as before. And uh, since this number is unique, for you know that can be assumed for most cases, uh, then uh, that interface identifier becomes like a super cookie, and you can uh, essentially uh, identify the user by simply looking at the IP address. The second variant. Uh, for tracking network activity is uh, uh, like uh, an active attack version. So let's assume that we have an attacker that uh, is targeting a specific user that employs constant interface identifier, uh, in, uh, constant inter interface identifiers, and the attacker knows that uh, there are a specific subset of networks where these uh, victim could attach to. So if I want to find, uh, you know, where the uh, target user is, I could active uh, prove, you know, what should be the address of that user within that network. So if I know the subnet prefix and I also know what's the uh, interface ID that uh, that user would employ in that network, I can simply send some sort of proof packet. Um, if I don't find it, I could proceed to the other network and then finally to the last network where the attacker, where, where the victim actually is. Okay, so that as much for uh, activity correlation. Uh, what about address scans? Well, um, um, IPv6 address scans were uh, originally considered unfeasible because you know having 64 bits for the subnet means that there are so many addresses there that you couldn't actually brute force scan all of that address space. But if uh, you have uh, interface IDs that actually follow patterns, then you know the search space actually can be reduced quite a lot. Uh, I will provide just two examples. Just consider the case, for example, where a DHCP version 6 server leases addresses from a slash uh, 112. Uh, now the, address, the, the, the search space obviously has been reduced a lot. And if you wonder, yeah, this is done quite a lot by many uh, DHCP server implementations. And you could also have other cases where, for example, um, sites uh, manually configure uh, or somehow configure the uh, the interface uh, the interface IDs uh, to the IP before address of the same network interface. That's quite popular, for example, for content delivery networks. 
okay? Now, in all of those cases, you will have reduced the search space. And if you wonder, yeah, there are tools that, uh, scanning tools that actually leverage patterns, not only these two, but also many others, to actually be able to find, uh, to, to perform address scans. The final one uh, was device-specific attacks, and the idea is simple. If you look at the legacy scheme for uh, generating interface identifiers, um, essentially it calls for embedding the MAC address in the interface ID. That, of course, reveals your MAC address, but not just that, because the MAC address also reveals the vendor of your network interface card. And this could be exploited in some scenarios for attackers to be able to um, uh, perform device-specific attacks in which they can simply learn what's the manufacturer, for example, of your network interface card by looking at your IPv6 address without any further uh, help. So I have uh, uh, provided this uh, summary table for you know how all of these uh, you know aspects applies to the different schemes that we have for generating um, oh. you know interface identifiers. I will not go th uh, through detail for each of these because of time constraints, but you can see that in the worst uh, case scenario, you have the legacy scheme. Uh, specified by 4291, where essentially, uh, you know, if interface IDs are configured with that scheme, the you know the addresses are subject can be subject to host tracking correlation within the same subnet, address scans, device specific uh, and device specific attacks. Now, on the other stream, if you wish, you have uh, addresses uh, or interface IDs specified by 4941, in which most of these things are mitigated. Actually, uh, if you look at 4941 itself, uh, it's not so much the case because it has some flaws, but when we get to publish the revised specification anytime soon, that uh, this should be the, the case where most of the things are uh, mitigated. Still, there is some correlation possible within the same subnet because, of course, uh, these are temporary addresses which change over time, but it's not that you use one address for each network activity that you perform. So there's still some you know, level of uh, activity correlation that is possible. There are some things, some, some caveats to consider, which I will not get into detail, but let's just mention them. Uh, when analyzing the things, you need to consider all of the uh, address uh, configuration mechanisms because, for example, you could have uh, you know your system doing the right thing for Slack, like doing 7217 and temporary addresses for Slack, but then you attach to a network that has a DHCP server that leases predictable addresses. That was my case at home, for example. So you have to keep this in mind. Uh, you also need to consider the implications of all of the different addresses that you use. Because, for example, your host might employ both stable and temporary addresses. And sometimes when this happens, people just consider, you know, the, the how all these things affect you from the point of view of the temporary address. But, you know, normally you get the union of the vulnerabilities of both of the addresses that, uh, of all of the address types that you employ. Other things to consider is how all this affects um, uh, networks where uh, you have stable prefixes and you have a low uh, host density. And why? Well, because, for example, if you have a network and you have, a let's say, a single host and the network employs a stable prefix, well, even if the host actually changes its address, well, it would still be, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it would still be possible to correlate a network activity based on the stable prefix. So that's something to consider. And the final thing to consider, at, at, at least as far as this list goes, um, um, is that you should also consider, uh, you know, how MAC address randomization affects all these, or to the, the other way around, how the way in which we configure addresses uh, affects MAC address randomization. Because, for example, you could be changing your IPv6 addresses, but you might not be randomizing your MAC address. And now, if the faults um, uh, essentially trying to do activity correlation uh, are, you know, present on the hotspot, then, you know, uh, what you do at the IP layer might not affect what they are doing. Uh, finally, Hello, just, Fernando, just a quick time yeah. check. We're running up against time now for okay. the talk. Um, I don't know if you want to just run through these two yeah. slides quickly and um, then we can take one or two questions. 
Yeah, um, essentially for IPv4, we have two scenarios where in the case where you have nuts, in the case where you're not. And this is a way, this is the how you are affected in those cases. Um, you know, in the case in which you're not, normally uh, correlation is more difficult and so on. Whereas in the case where you are not not, there are some things that you are kind of like protected against, but other things become possible, such as, uh, you know, correlation within the subnet and other scans. So that's mostly it. Um, excellent. So uh, as before, we do have time for one or two very brief questions. There is one uh, in the chat for you, uh, Fernando, if you want to check it out from Caleb. Yeah. Uh, let's see. OK, uh, regarding the stable prefix, there has been a SARBI that says that about 35% of the SARBI users are employing stable prefixes. So that's the data that the only data that I could provide. Uh, that's a survey. So I, I I wouldn't be able to tell, um, uh, you know, how representative that is. And in the in the cases where they are not employing a stable prefixes, it varies the extent to which the prefixes are not stable. For example, it's quite common for ISPs to rotate the prefix once a day. So whether that's stable enough or not, it's. Uh, you know, it's uh, depends on the point of view. Um, okay, uh, if there are no other questions, I think we can move on. Uh, thank you, Fernando, for this great overview, and especially for condensing uh, sort of the takeaways into some tables for everyone. Um, that was quite useful. Um, thank you. Ne next up, we have uh, Christian. Christian, I um, passed you the token. Okay, and you're sharing. Um, and while you bring that up, uh, Stephen asks um, uh, a question for me, but I'm going to relay it for the group. Um, we are running a bit over schedule right now. Um, uh, so in the interest of uh, keeping the discussion going, we're not going to you know, cut anyone off uh, earlier. Uh, we might just have to overflow into the next meeting. Um, so anyways. Uh, carry away, Christian. Cannot hear you if you're speaking. You, I think you're muted still. We still can't hear you. We come back to Christians. Yeah, George, would you be ready to speak if we uh, put you in here and we come back to Christian? No. Uh, yes, I think I can do that. Okay, Christian, um, we're going to pass the ball over to him. Um, stand by. Can you can you see my video by the way because I can't see any video. Um I'm trying to find you in the No, we don't have video. All right. But that's okay. That's okay. Yeah, as long as we can see your screen. And hey, that's all we need. That's all we need. All right. Um I still cannot share my screen. Ah, there we go. Here's the button. La la, let me see. Apologies for the technical hiccup there. <laughs> um, can you see my screen now? 
It is uh, loading. Um, I'll let you know when we can see something. Nothing. It's, Nothing. It's stuck on a screen saying you're starting to share, but that's Fantastic. okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, I am unmuted now. It's uh, the, this WebEx <laughs> interface is weird. <laughs> All right. So, what would you like to do? Uh, well, your screen sharing doesn't appear to be working, um, and since Christian figured it out, um, I'm just going to quickly toss it back to him. Um, Sounds good. Sounds okay. Good. Sorry, George. <laughs> Sorry to everyone. Uh, can you can you share can you share the slide from the from the server? It'll be easier, I guess. Uh, for me, yes. Or for your talk, uh, yes. Hold on. Um, because I don't, I don't want to repeat the same process that led to failure. Uh, well, th th this talk I'm giving is about uh, anonymity pools, and uh, the the reason I'm concerned about anonymity pools is that anonymity pools are a feature of many privacy designs. And uh, if, uh, if you look at that, you have many privacy designs in which uh, uh, someone tries to hide their activity by conducing it through a sharing pool. For example, multiple users might go through the same, uh, say, web proxy. And then what comes out, and can we go to the second slide, please? Yes. Next slide. Yes. So, so basic. That was one slide too many. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Uh, so basically, the the design is that you will send a lot of activity for a pooling server, and then the activity will be coming out, and an attacker that observes what's come in the server and comes out the server cannot make heads or tail of it because there is too much traffic coming in to be able to easily correlate what comes in to what goes out. And this design is found in many, many um, privacy tools. I mean, the Tor nodes rely on that and they, they do additional tricks to make sure that the correlation is hard, but they basically rely on that. Using VPNs for privacy relies on that. Uh, using uh, DNS over HTTP or DNS over TCP relies on that uh, in the case that uh, basically you can, if you could correlate the DNS query coming in, the address of the DNS query coming in, and the target of the DNS query on the other side, then you could break the privacy of the DNS encryption. Uh, obvious, oblivious DNS relies on that. Encrypted SNI relies on that too. I mean, basically, the idea is you, you encrypt the, the SNI and then you send that to a fronting server that supposedly choose between very many plausible uh, servers on the other side. And so the attacker doesn't know which one you used. And so it's basically all these anonymity pool design. And my problem with that, in the next slide, please, is that. Uh, if your anonymity pool is shallow, then the pooling doesn't provide much privacy. Suppose that you have only one or two customers going into the proxy or the server or whatever, then it becomes really easy for an attacker to correlate what comes in and what comes out. And so uh, my, my wonder was, hey, do we have a problem in practice? Do we have a problem that affect a number of our privacy designs? And I believe we do. And the example of that is the uh, privacy provided by encrypted SNI or Edge, if you prefer. Next slide, please. Uh, I did my own study of that, and then uh, the authors of the paper I cite there uh, pointed me to their study, which is much better. 
basically what they did is that they took the um, top 1 million domain, they were using both the list from Alexa and the uh, Magic Million and etc. And they looked at how those address gets reused among those million top sites. And the high level summary is they don't get reused very much. I mean, if you look at the, uh, the uh, commuted frequency distribution curve that are on the right of my, of my slide there, uh, you see that most IP address are used by exactly one server. So if your IP address is used by exactly one server, then something like uh, hiding the SNI is not going to hide your destination. And, and that's a problem because if we sell people on the idea that if they use ESNI, then their traffic will not be identifiable, uh, we are selling a bag of lies. I mean, by just looking at the IP address, you can retrieve the information. The IP address of the server will tell you just as much information as the SNI would do. And even in a, if the case, if there are a few servers, you see that in the current, uh, in the CFD curve, 95% uh, or so of uh, the, more than 90% of uh, the, uh, of the server share their address with fewer than 10 other IP addresses. So, Let's go to the next slide about what can we do about that. And what I, I think we should be uh, doing about that is adopt as a general principle that if we want to hide something, we have to rely on choice, not chance. For example, uh, take the example of Oblivious DNS, which is designed on that. I mean, the idea of Oblivious DNS is that you go through three layers of DNS server instead of one. You go for your ISP DNS, and then you go from that to the Oblivious DNS server, and then you go for that to the recursive DNS server, with the idea that uh, the, the recursive DNS server will know what the final target is, and the Oblivious, but it will, won't know the, the source, the obvious, oblivious DNS server will be able to correlate I mean, the ISP address and the target, but not the actual IP address of the, of the client. And the ISP DNS will have limited visibility. And that's an example of choice in which the user has chosen an obvious, oblivious DNS server to provide a privacy service for them. I think that in the case of Encrypt SNI, we need to have something similar. Right now, Encrypt in Encrypt SNI approaches architectures, we only rely on the choice made by the fronting server. That's basically the hidden server chooses a fronting server and in that way builds an anonymity pool of many servers hiding behind the fronting server. But as I said, that pool can be shallow. So if you want to have anonymity, people have to actively choose a proxy that provides a big enough pool so that going for that proxy actually hides the IP address. If you don't do that, then basically you have very little privacy gain of using this anti SNI service. Next slide, please. Now, if we said that the, the proxy is actively providing an, a, a privacy service, you have a question about how are those proxy going to be deployed exactly? And there have been many approaches. Basically, the, the main two approach we see today are large tech companies deploying big proxy or big sharing service. I mean, an example of that would be Google DNS, for example, that mixes the traffic of a bunch of people and, uh, 
and then makes it out so that the, the actual DNS request cannot be easily identified. Uh, relying on large tech companies is nice, except that it means you have to trust the companies. And yes, those companies are making assurances, but since they do rely on the surveillance capitalism model of business, it's hard to take those uh, uh, assurances as going to remain the same permanently. In any case, uh, going for large tech companies is a variation of the world garden approach, and that has issues by itself. The alternative is to rely on volunteers. The problem of relying on volunteers is that volunteer service are not necessarily sustainable. We have had examples in the past of volunteer service that have to close because they were abused. Typically, someone will run a server in a university, for example, and at some point, the university management will tell them, hey, that server that you are here, it's costing you a lot of money, who is using it? And they dig a little and they say that some pretty unsavory people are using it to do porn or worse. And they say, hey, why are we paying for that? And then they close it and you can have cascading failures of volunteer fa service by that kind of mechanism because once one close, the load on the other increases, etc., etc. It can be spiraling. And yet another alternative is to have specialized services. I mean, that uh, as in the, uh, the picture provides superior hiding services. And you buy the superior hiding service from your service that somehow charter users. So we have this dilemma there that uh, open access invite frauds. But if the solution to open access is to have a service you pay for, then that service has to identify that you are a valid customer in order to give you access. And thus, this privacy service force you to identify yourself, which is kind of a contradiction. So are we doomed? That's where I am dreaming. And if you can have the next slide, please. Uh, Basically, I think that we have to take this business of uh, how to fund the privacy services, we have to take that very seriously. Because if you don't fund them and you rely on side effect of something else, then uh, we have an issue. And I think that if we want to do that correctly, we will end up requiring some form of uh, anonymous micropayment system, pretty much in the line of what uh, David Schaum was uh, envisaging in the, in the 80s. Uh, that means that basically, if you go to a privacy server, uh, instead of sending your identity, you pass some kind of token that is blinded and that says, yes, I am a good user, here's the proof. And those tokens can then be treated pretty much like uh, micropayments uh, to protect the privacy service and make sure it is not abused. As I said, uh, it's much easier said than done. That's why I think I'm kind of dreaming there, but I'd like people to dream with me. Next slide, please. And Sarah, as you see, I'm trying to not be too long. So I'm going back to the shallow pool. Uh, in the specific case of uh, ESNI, uh, we can observe that one server per IP address is pretty much the norm today. And for that reason, ESNI only provides limited benefits. It will provide benefits for some server that happens to share IP address, but not for most servers. Uh, effective privacy requires to have an explicit relaying. The choice of relay is very consequential because if you choose that, like, uh, there are a lot of unsavory VPNs out there. So if people buy a VPN in order to get privacy, but that VPN ends up uh, keeping track on them, 
they have done the opposite of getting privacy. I think that if we want to use proxies largely, the proxy business has to be sustainable. And if we don't do that, we'll end up with some kind of compromise that is not guaranteeing privacy. And I think that it should be an explicit work item for the peer working group. Thank you very much. All right, um, we probably have time for a quick question. Um, is there anyone in the queue? It's like Damien is in the queue. If I'm reading this correctly, um, I don't know, Christian. You can read his question out loud or answer it. Yeah, I mean, uh, 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 Damien's question is whether I worry that uh, the proxy become a central aggregation point for a given user traffic and uh, and makes for a fat target. That's a very good question, and that's indeed why we have to be explicit about the choice of proxies. I could say that the generic uh, solution there is to shuffle. Uh, that's also why I would like to, uh, I mean, I'm worried about having to authenticate to the proxy, but even without authenticating, it's indeed the case that the proxy can track IP addresses. So uh, it's probably the case, I mean, uh, in Tor, it's, uh, it's well known that you try to have at least three layers of proxies in order to minimize these kind of cases. Uh, but we have to look at the architecture of proxying to provide guarantees. If we just hope for natural anonymity pools, it won't work. If we uh, hope, uh, if we try to reuse other services like VPNs, it will also not work because of these tracking effects. Uh, yeah, great. Thank you. I just a uh, quick one to know and uh, for people who are perhaps not familiar with uh, the work ongoing in the ITF on privacy pass um, that has uh, flavors of the things you're discussing here, um, especially around uh, Sham's work uh, earlier on blinded signatures and digicache and stuff. So um, that might have uh, that might be relevant to the discussion um, that Perigee um, should hopefully work on. Um, are there any other questions? Or if not, we can move on to George. Okay, uh, thank you, Christian. Um, uh, thank you. So George, um, do you wanna try sharing your screens again? George, I've handed you the. Uh... I'm sorry for um, for my internet going down. Okay, so let's let me try to share this thing. Hopefully, it's gonna work this time. Um, let's see. If it doesn't work, we'll have to uh, go the other way. I I will share them for you if it doesn't work. All right. Okay. So connecting. I actually went and tried on GT and it correctly shared them. So I don't know. I've never used WebEx before. Hmm. I have them up and ready to go if you'd like me to just share them for you. <laughs> All right. I guess let's do it this way. And I will be constantly saying next slide like annoying. All right. Let's 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 do it. All right, let's go. All right, so hello people. I'm George. I work as an engineer on Tor. Um, on this talk, I'm gonna give you like a basic rundown of um, what Tor is doing at this stage, the next steps, and also I'm gonna touch a bit on the denial of service um, prevention and a bit of discussion and possible countermeasures, which seems relevant to the things being said before. So on the next slide, 
Uh, so I'm not going to go on the technicals of how uh, Tor works. I'm going to assume that people kind of know this, but Tor is capable of protecting the IP address of Alice, the client, on the left side, but also of, of Bob on the right side. So it's able to, to both protect the anonymity of, of users like me, but also of services like websites or whatever. And it does this through the use of an anonymity network, which is the Tor network. Um, on the next slide, um, so we can see that Tor has, depending on how you count, because it's not easy to measure uh, the clients of an anonymous network. We have about 2 million users, but other researchers have, have counted up to 8 million users. So we have many millions of users. Um, on the daily. And on the next slide, you can see um, the network size, which is the number of relays. Uh, these are volunteer run relays, so we don't like pay people to do it. Uh, they are run by people, mainly by people and organizations who um, are trying to maintain the network. And through those computers is where your traffic goes to become anonymous. So um, on the next slide, um, right now, uh, we're constantly working on improving Tor uh, towards all directions. So for example, um, we're currently doing uh, lots of work on performance improvements. Uh, so um, we are aiming to improve our congestion control because our network does have a lot of um, capacity, but because our congestion control is sucky, it doesn't, we, we cannot use all that capacity effectively. Um, we're, we're looking at, at, at various load balancing improvements and other stuff like that. Um, also, we're constantly working on improving security in various ways, both on the protocol side, but also like on the, um, you know, on the binary side. So for example, we're we're investigating how to move to Rust instead of C, because right now the core daemon of, of Tor is a huge uh, C daemon. Um, we're also constantly working on UX improvements on our browser, because that's the product where our users um, interact with the network. It's, it's basically a browser. Um, also, better API for mobile integration and better censorship circumvention because there is many, many users who use Tor to circumvent censorship, especially in certain countries. So this is like the stuff that we're working on, but um, I think more uh, to the interest of this group, um, please, next slide. Um, I'm gonna talk about um, denial of service attacks. So we denial of service attacks, as I said before in the previous uh, conversations, uh, are, are notoriously hard to defend against, and especially on, um, on the decentralized network with anonymity, because we don't have IP addresses, we don't have reputations. Sometimes we don't even know if an attack is going on. So for example, um, in the beginning of January, um, our, our network was being attacked and it was actually hard to distinguish whether it's a malicious attack or someone coded um, a client that was doing uh, very stupid things. So next slide, please. Um, so denial of service attacks on Tor. Um, are in various places. So for example, they can be um, attacking the network uh, by shutting down the relays or shutting down the directory authorities or um, causing chaos over there, but they could also be on the right side. So on the service side. So when I told you that we can have um, anonymity on the service side, that's onion services. And there are also attacks that can happen there. And next slide, please. So, um, so right now, um, Onion services are being attacked by denial of service adversaries. And these adversaries are currently 
um, exploiting the asymmetries of the of the Tor protocol when it comes to onion services. So the basic idea here is that you know a client sends a, a message to the onion service, uh, and to do that it uses work X, but the service to respond effectively, it needs to consume work 10x. So this asymmetry is what makes onion services particularly juicy for DOS attacks. And it's basically uh, what the attackers do. So, so far, we've been, we've been um, deploying various defenses, but they are all kind of trying to reduce this asymmetry. You know, these multipliers kind of reduce them, chip them down a bit. So for example, we have onion balance, which is like a tool to do some um, uh, geographical load balance of, of onion services. So, you know, you split your onion service into 10 nodes instead of one node. But, you know, this is, this is a defense, but it just does a, it just removes a, a multiplier of, on the number of nodes. It doesn't really do a big uh, order of magnitude change. And when we're talking about motivated adversaries, and when we're talking about the protocol with a big asymmetry, um, many times um, this geographical load balancing does not really address the core of the problem. Um, we've also done work on better managing um, connections that are malicious, so giving more options to the app, to the operators to cut down certain connections. Um, but as I told you, these are all uh, these are all countermeasures, and they're not like affecting um, the the core of the problem. Um, so now I'm going to talk to you about uh, two uh, defenses that are more in depth. There is actually another slide here, but because we did this uh, thing, I don't have it. But anyway, let's keep this slide still. So the the first defense I want to go into is a defense uh, based on proof of work um, schemes. And in my opinion, it, it, it is extremely effective against uh, low to medium strength adversaries. Uh, but not effective against larger adversaries. The idea is that before clients contact the onion service, um, they have to solve a proof of work puzzle. Um, and we went into designing such a defense and finding such a proof of work system. And if you if you look closely, you can find proof of work systems that fit our design restriction. So they are quick to verify because you don't want the verification of the proof of work to become a threat. They have a proof size that is small, and also they are they have um, GPU resistance. So you know if an attacker, so a botnet, for example. Um, tries to, 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 to compete with regular clients, the botnet will have to spend much more CPU work to, to get requests to, to, to go through. And the system we designed is uh, has like a, in quotes, a proof of stake mechanism. So it doesn't prioritize all the requests the same. And instead, depending on the strength of the proof of work token, it, it prioritizes them accordingly. So, you know, if a client really wants to go to that service, they can spend 10 minutes and, and, and build a super huge proof of work thing and go through. So this actually has been suggested before in the SSL working group uh, by Alex Piryukov and another group to do client puzzles for TLS because TLS suffers from a similar issue where Client hello is cheap, but server hello and server certificate and all that stuff is kind of heavier. So this has been suggested before, and it's something that we're looking to um, experiment with. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, but let me go into a defense that I think is more relevant to the discussion here, both because, you know, I don't think big services can ask their users to wait 10 minutes or even two seconds more because speed is 
paramount. So, okay, so let's talk about anonymous credentials. Christian from the talk before mentioned them, so I'm gonna continue building on the on the topic because I think it has lots of lots of things to do with the conversation here. So the idea is that an anonymous credential or a token, so to say, is like you know it's like a, a train ticket. So it's a it's a it's a it's a little thing, a token that you have, and it's unlinkable to your identity. So if you show it multiple times the person who validates it cannot link those users between them, these redeem, redeems, they're not linkable, and they have various properties. So you can think of it as a train ticket, which you can get stuff with, but it doesn't write your name on. And if you throw it on the street and someone finds it, they cannot link it to your actual name. Um, so we think that um hi george so sorry to jump in again we're running short on time we've got a couple more minutes for your presentation if i could uh ask you to all work right on. okay sorry. thank you, thank you. All right, no problem so this has been used before in uh, uh technologies like privacy pass and signal and we think that it's going to be quite useful for um the denial of service defenses because uh you know you can better control the clients that go into uh, the onion service and which not. And also, I think it has lots to do with the reputation of exit nodes because we can start better controlling the clients who um, reach the exit nodes and kind of have a better reputation based system, but without anonymity leakage. Um, so, next slide, please. So, we, I, the anonymous credential uh, scene is just getting started and there is tons of schemes out there, all with different properties. So, you can have revocation, you can have delegation, there is lots of properties and lots of crypto to handle. And it's something that people are working on these days. And it's something that we in Tor are also monitoring closely to see how it fits us and what we can do with it. Next slide, please. All right, so these are a few ways we hope to get across on how we, we hope to tackle denial of service attacks in the future. Um, and we are looking forward to more standardization work, both on proof of work systems, but also on uh, the design and implementation of anonymous credential schemes that have properties and performances that can be used in everyday life. So thanks a lot. and. This was my uh, presentation. All right, thank you, George. Um, are there any questions? George, there's one for you specifically, uh, sort of a meta question. Um, would you mind linking to the uh, spec proposals which describe the proof of work and the anonymous credentials base uh, solutions? here in the chat um, for posterity so others can check them out if they're interested. Yes, for sure. Uh, we don't really have a spec for the anonymous credential stuff because there is lots of research to be done, but we do have a spec for the proof of work stuff and I'm gonna link it on the chat. Lovely, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, all right, so if there are no other questions, uh, I think we can move on to the next presentation, uh, which is Justin. Um, just as before, I'm going to try and give you the token. Um, All right. <clears throat> can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. And you should have a chance to share now. I don't see a button to share. Should be on the, I don't know what client you're using, but on the native app, it's on the bottom. Um, I'm not seeing, I see a three dot menu, but I don't see a thing to actually share here. Um, I can pull them up then, if that would be helpful. Yeah, if you do that at a given time, why don't we just go with that? Sure, one second.
Okay, should be ready. All right, thanks. All right, so uh, I'm Justin Uberti and I've worked on WebRTC where we've had to try to come up with techniques to allow clients to connect with each other peer to peer while simultaneously not providing, you know, additional information on IP addresses that would, you know, uh, harm privacy. Uh, next slide. So when two WebRTC peers want to start up a multimedia session, a peer to peer session, they go through a process where they exchange things called candidates. Uh, these are basically IP port tuples of various addresses, but the most important address in some cases is the address of their local network interfaces. And they pass these uh, from one side to another so that you know, peer A can connect to peer B's local network interface and, and vice versa. Next slide. Next, next, okay. So, uh, you know, what happens, you know, each browser uh, on the request of the application will open up a UDP socket and get that IP port tuple of their local network interface. Uh, the browser then provides this information to the app, you know, saying, hey, you have an address that you can use uh, for the other side to reach you. Then the app will use its own sort of mechanism. It can be over XHR, it can be a web socket to basically communicate the address to the remote peer. And that's really outside the scope of the browser, but there's just some channel where the application now has access to the IP address in, in raw form. So uh, that gives the application a lot of flexibility into how it does that. But it also means the application has, you know, now it can see the actual IP address. And th this causes its own, you know, issues, which I'll, I'll get to in a minute. Uh, next slide. So, you know, how this works in practice, just sort of, you know, illustrating it, you know, Client A on the, on the left in blue, you know, gets its own local network interface and port tuple, passes this up to the application, who then passes it through a cloud service to the other side, who then receives it in their application over hanging get or some such, and then passes it down to the browser. And at that point in time, you know, the client B on the right has client A's IP address and can establish a direct peer to peer connection. Next slide. And then client B will do the same. It'll get its own network uh, interface address and, and, and allocate a port, send that to the other side. So now both sides can try to make a connection with each other. Next slide. Okay, so you know we can establish these peer-to-peer -peer connections, and this is great, especially for things inside like a, a LAN. It can allow for very efficient, uh, you know, peer-to-peer -peer distribution of media or other sort of large files or other or communications that require low latency. But the app has access to IP address information that it wouldn't otherwise have had. You know, typically the app can see, uh, you know, in the web server, the address from the client that, from which it connected, which will typically be a NATed address. Uh, but here it'll be able to actually, actually access the IP interface of the machine. And, uh, you know, that sort of, uh, you know, interface, you know, the IP information plus the, you know, uh, the publicly visible IP address can be used in many cases as a super cookie. And we've seen people actually using this in ad networks, uh, you know, do, I, I assume for either fraud protection or for, you know, super cookie type uh, mechanisms. Uh, and one option could just be, hey, we don't support this type of behavior. We're not gonna give these addresses out to the application. We're just gonna say, hey, whatever public interface, uh, public IP address you get, that's what you have and you, you know, do with it what you can. Uh, however, that prevents these sort of uh, LAN scenarios, two devices being able to connect directly within the same local network and reduces a lot of the value of having peer-to-peer -peer connections. So uh, we're trying to figure out what to do here. Next slide. And uh, some folks at Apple came up with some ideas around using MDNS uh, to basically wrap these addresses. And this technique has been deployed and actually works quite well where upon getting the IP address, instead of uh, passing the IP address to the application, you actually uh, register, register an MDNS name for uh, maps one-to-one -to, -one to the IP address. And then you pass the MDNS name and port through the service up to the application. And then upon reaching the other side, the other side, if it's on the same local area network, will be able to resolve the MDNS address, find the IP, and then the browser will be able to connect directly as before. But in this case, the app 
has never been able to access the uh, the IP address, the raw IP address uh, directly. Uh, next slide. And so this basically walks through the steps. You know, every time when it goes to hand an IP address, it goes and registers that name. It does this on like a per origin basis so that these names are not correlatable. Uh, but basically the, the MDNS address serves as a wrapper for the IP. And if the other side happens to be on the same network, it can resolve it. And uh, if it wasn't able to resolve it, then the IP address probably is not reachable anyway. Uh, so it actually works out quite well in practice. There are some cases, of course, where MDNS does not work. Uh, I'll get to that in the next slide. Next. So, you know, the easiest way to think about this is that the MDNS is essentially a, a wrapper function. Uh, and like wrapping it, you know, with a sort of pseudo key where the key is basically the fact that they're on the same network segment and, you know, the MDNS technique can allow it to resolve or unwrap uh, the MDNS address back to a, a plain IP. Uh, you know, there are some cases where MDNS is not supported and we try to figure out what can be done in those cases. And one potential opportunity here is to use a, a key distributed through say Chrome Enterprise Policy, DHCP, to basically allow this wrapping to be done uh, using the straight encryption rather than using uh, MDNS uh, and, and still have this property where the browsers can have their IPs directly, but the application only gets the obfuscated or, or wrapped IPs. But this has uh, been a pretty critical technique to WebRTC sort of working well on, on LANs and then also having uh, this property that we we're not giving up any uh, additional IP addresses that would not be otherwise available to the app. And that's all. There's some links there to the documents uh, for both MDNS ice candidates and to um, the additional work on encrypted ice candidates. Uh, but I hope have, have to take any questions now. All right. Um, yeah, thank you, Justin. Uh, are there any questions? Um, okay, if not, um, that was super quick. Thank you for going through it. Um, and uh, if you're interested in the design, can check out the links here. One question, question in the chat, chat. Please. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't scroll down. Uh, go ahead, Dave. What's in the chat? I mean, since you're using MDNS and MDNS isn't encrypted, that says, doesn't that say anybody can snoop the LAN and learn these addresses, potentially passing them outside for DDoS attacks? If you have an eavesdropper on the LAN, they can see a given endpoint registering an MDNS address, you know, for a given IP. Uh, you know, and if that was a malicious sort of eavesdropper and was trying to broadcast the information publicly, then it would allow somebody to, you know, do that unwrapping. But you would basically need to have collusion between, you know, the application that's running on or in, in the browser and in this sort of endpoint that happens to be embedded in the uh, in the land and, and seeing these MDNS queries. You know, generally, if you're able to do the MDNS resolution directly, then like the obfuscation benefits are are gone. Okay, uh, Fernando. Um, you're muted. I, I, you seem to be talking, but you're muted. Yeah, there we go. Um, sorry, um, I haven't been following the web RTC work, but um, you know, from your presentation, it, um, you know, I understand that in cases where uh, MDNS is not available. There might be challenges with, uh, you know, setting up a domain name, but it would seem to me that web RTC dealing with domain names from an architectural point of view is the right thing, as opposed to be dealing with IP addresses, not just for the privacy reason that you mentioned, but you know, from other perspectives as well. Yeah, I mean, like it's nice if, if it's possible. The problem is that since peers don't typically have domain names, you know, establishing that low latency peer to peer connection is challenging uh, unless you have like this just in time registry uh, as might happen here with, with MDNS. Uh, yeah, it would seem to me that at times, not just with this case, but with other things, some problems that come up 
actually signal that there is something that you are missing in the architecture or something that you're doing wrong. Like, you know, it's like, I mean, I don't want to start that debate, but it's like, you know, when people argue that, you know, nuts are breaking all these things, and many of the things that get broken is that because you are doing them the wrong way. That's what I'm saying. So yeah, you know, the DNS stuff that is missing and that is challenging, you know, I understand and actually I, I, I agree with that. What I'm saying is that it probably brings up something that maybe we should be doing something that we are not. So that's probably an opportunity like saying, well, if we wanted, for example, to be dealing with domain names, probably, you know, we should find a way, uh, you know, for example, uh, by which HOTS could be able to get a domain name to, to use. I've seen other cases where, you know, uh, this kind of thing would be necessary and they face the same challenge and the same problem. Okay. I mean, it'd be interesting to see if there were similar problems that were solved through this. You know, the concern, of course, is always that if you add in a, a registry, that's another single point of failure that has to be, you know, dealt with as part of the, the, the setup sequence, which could be quite challenging. Yeah. Uh, I want to turn over my time so we can finish on time. All right, thank you, Justin. Uh, especially if you're going through that so quickly. Um, uh, next up and last up is Brad. Um, Brad, how do you want to proceed? You want me to share, or can you share? Uh, the share button's disabled on my screen. I have yeah, I have to. Let me give it to you, and then we can give that a shot. You should see it now. All right, uh, those coming across. We can see your slides, thanks. All right, great. Um, so I wanted to talk about a proposal we made, uh, published last week. Um, and this is just a, a one proposal in order to address some of the concerns around IP privacy, but still allowing for some of the anti-abuse um, mechanisms that, that were discussed earlier. Um, so uh, just as a way of background, um, work on the uh, privacy sandbox with Chrome. Uh, first step is jeopardizing co cookies, but we need to address all the other mechanisms for uh, identity linking, including IP. Um, there are effectively three ways to address privacy uh, with IP addresses. One's to give one person many addresses, uh, for instance, one per tab. Another one's to give many people one address. Uh, and the third is to make servers not use uh, IP addresses for identity. Um, that first option of course slides aren't advancing right now uh we we found out as uh, as fernando was talking about uh with uh slack uh giving one person one one uh one person many addresses say an address per per uh, tab isn't uh really feasible in terms of um addressing the privacy concerns because the uh the prefix could be pretty uniquely identifying um so we pros nat catcher um has uh, two parts to it, uh, what we call a near path NAT and willful IP blindness. Um, we proposed willful IP blindness a little over a year ago. Um, it's effectively uh, ar arguing for uh, doing audits to ensure that servers are not using IP to uh, identify users and track users. I'll skip through some of the details about auditing. Um, and then with near path NAT, um, uh, recognizing that uh, the, the the audit mechanism would be uh, rather um, cumbersome to a lot of uh, players in the web, um, such that uh, as an alternative for um, most of the web, something along the lines of a near path NAT, where we can NAT at the CDN level at the edge, uh, close as close to the browsers and as close to the uh, path of, uh, of serving as possible, um, it, put in a privatizing server there, um, and have users that are geolocated uh, close to each other using the same uh, server such that a lot of the um, GOIP concerns are still addressed using this, this mechanism. Um, in order to support I, IP, uh, some of the anti-abuse work, um, a couple of uh, things are, are presented. The uh, IP addresses remain stable for each first party. So, um, a browser tab to example.com and a browser tab to publisher.com would have separate addresses, but if I revisited example.com, I would get the same IP address uh, port tuple as before. Um, yes, let me see. 
So here's a diagram of how this would work. You basically have a HP3 session to the IP privatizer, um, and it would hand out um, separate IP addresses going to each of the servers. Um, by being near path, uh, we're you know not altering the, the path of the overall connection and hopefully um, being rather efficient with performance. Um, I already talked about the GOIP and um, talked about how uh, by, by giving these stable um, IP addresses for a client and top level, um, most of uh, the anti-abuse uh, mechanisms uh, for first party still work. Um, the thought being that um, the, that a, a large third parties would be able to use the Wolf IP blindness and all, most first parties would be able to um, rely on the near path NAT. Um, proposing using the, uh, the mask work, which is already uh, underway at the IETF um, as the overall mechanism for um, doing this proxying. And that is a very short overview. I hope to uh, give a deeper dive uh, later. Yeah, great. Um, thank you for accommodating the short amount of time, Brad. Um, obviously, there's a lot to unpack here, um, and hopefully we can get to that in the next meeting with uh, high priority up at the queue. Um, uh, we probably have time for like very one, one very quick question uh, uh, before we wrap up and uh, discuss the next steps. So, uh, Christian, why don't you take it away? Yeah, that, that's an interesting idea, and it, it meets a lot of the requirements. There's something about uh, who pays for the new NAT, and uh, I guess we can discuss that later. But uh, I have a question about, isn't there a tension between the desire to have your proxy close to the user for performance reason and the size of the anonymity pool that you get? Uh, yes, um, but if you think about most um, CDN uh, edge, edge caches are designed to serve uh, at least a useful set of people. There is, there's costs associated with those servers. Um, so that, that seems like a, the right balance of the mapping of the number of, of users are being, being served by a particular node um, and giving those users some amount of privacy. I would trust that answer better if I saw statistics. Yep, um, needs to be explored further. All right. Um... Uh, Fernando, is it quick? Because <laughs> we're, we're is, right at the end. Yeah, uh, so my comment is that, you know, I have concerns with this idea of uh, trusted uh, servers and trusted providers. Like there is an assumption that for some reason, the user that wants privacy for some reason has to trust the company or, or an organization. And all specific names aside, you know, that's not the strategy that I would follow for the sake of privacy. So I like the, you know, whatever privacy strategy that I have that relies on not trusting whoever else I'm supposed to be trusting or I'm usually trusting. That's it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so that about uh, wraps it up. Uh, so next steps. Um, like they have a meeting in ITF 110, uh, again, to sort of uh, continue this topic uh, and, and do, a, I guess, a more uh, in-depth uh, debrief in terms of what we discussed here. I think there are a number of uh, important topics that were discussed today um, around IP reputation, around, you know, emerging technologies like masks and privacy paths and how they might um, benefit or improve the IP address privacy situation on the web. Um, so if you are curious in those technologies, I encourage you to check out the working groups that are um, going to hold meetings at 110 um, and also subscribe to the mailing list and check them out. Um, uh, I don't know, Sarah, Siobhan, do you want to add anything before we conclude? Just to say thanks again to all our presenters for uh, great presentations today. And yeah, I think there's a lot of follow-up work we can, we can look at here on a variety of topics. So we will follow up on the list tomorrow with a brief overview of our plan uh, moving forward. But if you have any specific ideas about pieces of work, please do write to the list. Thanks all. And uh, yeah, the same ideas, I think, come from this. Um, also, thank you, Ben, for taking notes. Uh, they were extremely thorough um, and will undoubtedly be very helpful in the future. So uh, special thank you to you. Uh, and with that, uh, we can call it. Um, Thank you all and enjoy the rest of your day.
Thank you.